In this video, I'm going to share some thoughts and information about online music lessons and give you a quick tour of my teaching studio, which has undergone quite a few transformations since the last time I made a video like this. Since you're watching this on YouTube, there's a good chance that you've seen some of my videos. And if not, my name is Chase Sanborn, and on this channel and in my lessons, I share things that I've learned in my career as a jazz trumpet player about jazz improvisation, brass playing, and aspects of being a professional musician. Demographically, my private students tend to fall into two categories, high school or university age students who are looking at the study of music as a potential career path, or adults who are often returning to music later in life. I teach students at any level, as long as they're eager to learn, patient, and willing to accept that music is a long game with no finish line. As a young person considering a career in music, there's a lot of things that you need to learn, and not all of them are about making the music. There's the music business, and then there's the business of being a musician. Now, a lot of that you can only get from experience, but in sharing my experiences as a commercial session player and jazz artist, hopefully you can get some sense of what might lie ahead for you, even as you focus on acquiring the skills that'll give you a shot at success in a highly competitive field. Now, admittedly, it's a field that looks quite different for you than it did for me, but I think that's true for every succeeding generation. As an older person learning or relearning music, you don't have the pressure of building a career. So music can be something that you do purely for enjoyment or a challenge, which is the ideal state of mind. The chances are that you've already built a career, and that in itself can be a source of frustration since you understand what it is to be an expert at something, and that could make you impatient to gain the musical expertise that you now seek. Regardless of your age or your ability, my goal is to help you reach your goals. Now, this is where individual lessons are quite different than a YouTube video. In this format, it's a one-way street. I'm talking to you, but in a generic sense. In a lesson, we talk to each other, both with our voices and with our instruments. Now, new students often comment how startling it can be to converse with someone that you've been watching on YouTube, but I can assure you that I'm pretty much the same in person, if somewhat less scripted. Now, in comparing online lessons to in-person, the most obvious advantage is that we can connect from anywhere in the world. It's one of the positive outcomes of the pandemic that we've all become experts at telecommunication. But it's not the only advantage. Even if you're located in Toronto, as I am, there's a considerable time savings in working online rather than having to travel to and from the lesson. Plus, the time spent together is used efficiently since the online format seems to reinforce the fact that we are here to work. My impression at the end of most lessons is that the student's head is full to capacity, sometimes a little bit too full, I imagine, but that's what you want from a lesson, to feel that you've got something to go on and to work on. There is, of course, some loss of personal interaction in the online format. That's especially true if I'm working with a group or a class where each individual person appears as a small square on the screen, and that's if they even have their camera turned on. In the one-on-one -on -one setting, with just one face on the screen, I actually feel like the connection is pretty solid. So to me, that hasn't really been a hindrance. The biggest challenge is technological, primarily the sound quality and the transmission lag that makes it effectively impossible to play together simultaneously. Now, there's ways to work around that. For example, if we're working with a backing track, we each should have the capability to play it on our end so that we sound in sync on the other end. Speaking of play-along tracks, I recommend that you play them on a separate device rather than from the computer that's running the Zoom session. A phone and a Bluetooth speaker works great. In terms of connecting on Zoom, a computer gives you more flexibility than an iPad for connecting external devices and adjusting the meeting settings. There's a few default settings in Zoom that need to be changed for music, and I can walk you through that in a minute or two at the beginning of a lesson. For improving the sound quality of your instrument, an external microphone will sound much better than the one that's built into the computer. Something like the Yeti Nano does a great job, and it's not terribly expensive. Now, I'll note that if you're using a webcam with a microphone, they tend to be the absolute worst at audio. In any case, before the lesson, check the audio settings menu to make sure that Zoom is using the correct microphone and that the levels are not set too high or too low. I can walk you through that as well. You'll also have a better experience if the sound on your end plays through an external sound system, which is something you may already have. You might choose to wear headphones, but unless you have the capability to feed your own sound into the headphone mix, it may not be an ideal solution to have your ears covered up when you play. You can mitigate that somewhat by using lightweight phones like Grado's. Now, I don't generally like using my Apple EarPods for Zoom, but some people do do it. So these are the things that I recommend for online students. An external microphone and speakers for the Zoom session, 
and a separate playback system for backing tracks. Now you can go a lot further than this and I'll show you now what I use, but for most students, this is all you need. Okay, so here we have an overview of my teaching space as it's currently configured. As you can see, there's a lot of gear and it's evolved over time as I've experimented with various solutions, essentially doing my part to keep Amazon in business. I'll walk you through the main components and I'll list them in the description. Starting with the computers, I use a Mac Mini to run the Zoom meeting on a 27-inch monitor and I use a laptop to view files and play external audio. As I said, it works better to play backing tracks from a separate device and being able to view files on the laptop saves me from having to fuss around with the main screen. I use separate microphones for my voice and for the horn so that I can set the level for each independently. For the voice, I use a shotgun mic made by Rode. That style of mic is highly directional, which mitigates the proximity effect. So if I'm a few inches closer or further away from the microphone, you don't hear the difference. For the horn, I use a pair of mics made by MXL. One's a ribbon and the other one's a condenser. Using two different mics balances and broadens the tonal profile. I do the same thing in my YouTube studio, but the mics are somewhat higher quality. The Rode mic runs through a preamp that's next to the laptop so that I can quickly turn it down when I play the horn. I like to have that knob right in my field of vision so that I remember to turn the voice mic back on, but any of my students will tell you that I still forget to do that from time to time. The three microphones and the audio output from the laptop are fed into a Soundcraft mixing board which connects to the Mac Mini via USB. I also feed in the audio from an iPhone running a metronome app. With this setup, I have independent level controls for all my sources, the Zoom session, the three microphones, and two external audio sources. Now, one of the things I really like about this mixer, and I didn't even realize it when I bought it, is that it lets me send a separate mix to a second headphone jack. So I can output audio to a stereo system without the microphones in the mix. That reduces the possibility of feedback, and it's made it so that I don't have to wear headphones when I'm teaching. For video, I use an Elgato face cam. Now, I've tried a lot of webcams, and this one is clearly the best, especially because of the great software control panel that works with it. The camera is located behind a teleprompter, which displays the image of a mini monitor that mirrors the main monitor. The beauty of this setup is that when I'm looking at a face on the screen, I'm also looking directly at the camera so the student sees me making eye contact. This system is a bit of a game changer as it's made communicating on Zoom feel much more like it does in person. Here's a little thing that I found very useful called the Stream Deck. It's a programmable device that gives you push button control of all sorts of things. So for example, I've got dedicated buttons for everything you might do on Zoom, including mute, switching the view, seeing the chat, sharing the screen, etc. For lighting, I use a pair of video lights pointed at me from either side and a compact RGB light for the background. Both are made by Newer. Right behind me are mirrored closet doors, so hanging a photography backdrop gets rid of the reflection and it gives me a clean background. Nothing else is visible on the camera, so I never have to clean up the place before a student arrives for a lesson. It took quite a bit of experimenting to get to the system that I have now, but it's been worth it in order to deliver the best possible online learning experience for my students. So I'll finish with a quick demo of what it looks and sounds like from the student's perspective.